my name's Chris Smith. Um, I'm a, an organiser for the Tertiary Education Union based here in Dunedin, and I have responsibility for the sciences division. Uh, for those, some people might remember that a long time ago I was the first uh, Equal Employment Opportunities Coordinator at the university, so I'm, uh, this is some, this, these issues are something that are dear to my heart, and um, once I came back to organising in the university, met with some members and thought we should, uh, had a wee look at some of the figures and what's happened over time and thought it might be something that we should uh, pick up uh, and, and run with again. Um, so this is our third um, session, and uh, at, but our first uh, meeting where we've had um, someone of, of Nicola's um, standing to come and talk with us, and thanks so much Nicola for coming. Um, the format for today will be that Nicola will do, uh, we've always, oh, I should also say we've invited um, women from members from Wellington and Christchurch Schools of Medicine. They often don't get the opportunity to participate in these sorts of events and we've uh, made it possible for them. I know we do have someone from Christchurch. A few people said they would be joining us. Uh, I, we did hear from Wellington, but it looks like no one's there at the moment, although they may, may pop in. Um, but we'll hear from Nicola and um, we'll, we'll have a bit of discussion further uh, after her presentation and then look at what we might do from here. There is a, a, a pad circulating where we're asking people to put their name and department and email address so we can contact you about further events. And one of my hopes at the end of this process is that feel free to... <laughs> Cheryl, is that we'd have a, a small uh, working group from within the TEU to look at um, developing a, a plan for moving things forward. I should introduce Suzanne McNabb, who is the um, National uh, Women's Officer for the Tertiary Education Union based in Wellington, and uh, we're looking at uh, this work across the country in our branches and universities. So uh, and we also have Naomi, who, will be ta who works in the TEU office locally, who will be taking some photos for our, of, of, our, of what we're doing here today. Um, so if I can pass over to you, Nicola, that would be fantastic. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here and talking about the subject, um, which is, as Chris said, also dear to my heart. Um, and I should say that I've prepared some slides, a presentation, if you will, um, but it is intended to be reasonably informal. So you know, it's a lunchtime uh, event. I figure if you've got something to say, please feel free to pipe up and ask questions as I put things up behind me. Um, I should also say that I was down here, um, oh gosh, it's probably about 18 months ago, Astrid, is that right? Um, to give a version of this talk or a more complete version of the original talk um, that I started giving about science being sexist. Um, and so this isn't, I'm trying not to repeat too much of what I said then, there'll be a couple of things uh, in the introduction. And then I thought what might be interesting is also to talk a little bit about my experiences since I published the book, Why Science is Sexist, and since I started talking about this, and that, that might help inform the conversation about what we can do, what we should do, maybe. Um, and so those are, those are, that's where I'm coming from. Um, Probably enough to be said for now. I should also say the um, the picture that I use on the uh, on the title slide here is a picture of a woman who was working at the physical and engineering laboratories of the DSIR in Wellington. Uh, it's from the early 40s uh, for reasons of uh, historical significance, which might not surprise anybody. Of course, um, that was a an opportunity for women to enter previously male-dominated areas of the workforce. Um, and I partly use it because I worked on, at the same campus in Gracefield. I was at um, Industrial Research Limited at Crown Research Institute for about five years. Uh, so that's part of the reference. Um, but really, I just use this as my title slide because she looks so happy. It's just, um, it's just quite, a nice, quite a nice picture, really. Woman doing science. Uh, so about just over a year ago, uh, November, 2015, um, this little book appeared. Um, when I call it a book, it's almost just a pamphlet. It's about 100 pages, it's a quick read. Um, it's not supposed to be a mighty tome. Um, but it's, it's my take on 
a little bit my own experiences, but my own experiences largely just in the context of why I decided to write about this. Um, and most of what I'm writing about is my experience in digging into the literature on unconscious bias, the psychology behind uh, some of the studies that show gender differences um, or the origin of gender differences as being, uh, well, less about individuals and more about behaviours. Um, so I wrote this little, little thing and I should say that I called it Why Science is Sexist um, for the simple reason that when I first gave a presentation about this, which was back at Industrial Research, it was actually on the last day that I was working there, um, for reasons that may not be too surprising, uh, it just felt like an opportunity. Um, and I called it Why Science is Sexist because that was the obvious question to me. Um, people had been raising the issue of why the demographics in that particular workplace were so bad. I think it's probably, probably the worst CRI. Um, I don't know who's taken on that mantle since IRL disappeared, but <laughs> uh, it was the worst CRI for, for gender balances, for demographics, as they, as they said, and that was partly around um, age as well as, as gender. Uh, but because of that, the leadership team were very interested in the problem. Um, and I think if you work in one of the male-dominated disciplines in science, the idea that there is a problem with women not being around is, is something that you, you learn about reasonably quickly and that people are perhaps even keen to make your problem as a woman in those disciplines. So the fact that there is disproportionate gender representation in science generally is uh, fairly well shown by data. Um, and when I use the word sexist, all I'm referring to is that there's a sexist outcome. Um, demonstrated by the data. And so the question that I'm interested in is why, what mechanisms are producing the sexist outcome. Um, here's my citation, because it's always good practice to have a nature reference if you can. Um, <laughs> they um, published this uh, issue devoted to the subject in 2014, um, and the editorial starts with the sentence, science remains institutionally sexist. So I figure if that's what I'm claiming, then um, here's my citation to back myself up. Um, despite progress, women scientists are still paid less, promoted less frequently, win fewer grants, and are more likely to leave research than similarly qualified men. Um, Many of you will also have heard of the term the leaky pipeline, uh, which is simply a, a metaphor used to, um, to demonstrate the fact that the problem, wherever it does exist, gets more acute at more senior levels. So while there are definitely differences between different scientific disciplines, between maths and physics or computer science perhaps at one end, and biology is usually um, used as the counterexample of a not so male dominated science, um, as you go through this pipeline from high school, say, to professorship, um, there is a very, very clear trend that does apply across all of those sciences. And this is data from the UK, um, simply because it's, it's one of the, the clearest examples that I've seen of, of how this works. But the same principle holds very well in New Zealand. Right. So how did I get interested in this? I do like to tell the story. It just... Um, I don't know, it captures a few things for me. Um, this is an invitation that I got from my HR department uh, when I was working at Industrial Research um, about a month before I left, so I'd already decided to leave, so this had nothing to do with it. Um, it's an invitation to an event at GNS Science, so another Crown Research Institute. Uh, it's co-organised and supported by the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, it includes a one-hour uh, session uh, presentation by Di McCarthy, who was then the Chief Executive of the Royal Society of New Zealand. And it's for women in leadership in the Crown Research Institutes. And it includes a two hour session after Di McCarthy on how to dress to influence. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see I still get that reaction. I've, I've talked about this quite a lot and I've, I've become a bit blasé about it. Um, so I, you know, my eyebrows hit the roof. Um, I might have almost hit the roof. Um, it was a very, very strange invitation to get. 
Uh, but one of the nice things about it was that it was very, very easy to explain to my male colleagues why I was outraged about it. It was like, would you go to a leadership event <laughs> where you were going to be taught how to dress? Um, and especially working in a CRI where the uniform is Kathmandu, uh, this, this came across um, reasonably straightforwardly. So that was, that was one thing. That happened a month, maybe six weeks before I, I was leaving IRL anyway. Um, and raised my eyebrows a bit. And then uh, around the same time, it had maybe come out a month previously, but very close in time, I saw this uh, paper, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. Um, and it is titled, Science Faculties, Subtle Gender Biases Favor Male Students. And it got quite a lot of attention for the simple reason that it was carried out with the participants in the study being actual scientists. So physicists, chemists, um, biologists, I think, uh, were the three uh, disciplines in the United States, people working as academics in those areas. And what happened was that they were sent a CV. Um, they all got the same CV. Uh, it was not for a, a very senior position. It was for a uh, a lab manager, so somebody with perhaps master's research level experience, I think. Um, and they were asked to evaluate the CV for whether they would hire somebody um, based on their hireability as a, as a category to rate uh, their competence as demonstrated by the CV, whether or not they were willing to mentor the person. And they were asked to nominate a salary that they would provide the person. And there's some data. Um, it's perhaps easier to summarize uh, here, where the male student um, was in all cases on competence, hireability and mentoring, uh, rated more highly than the female student. Now they all had the same CV. The only thing that changes is the name at the top of the CV. All right? And that's reasonably striking how that works. Um, it also results in this and I know I'm in a room of scientists and I have to say this every time, it's dreadful that the y-axis does not go to zero. <laughs> the, the, dis, the difference is not that big, it's about 12%, which happened to be the gender pay gap in New Zealand at the time I started talking about this, although it's gone up since then. But that's, yeah, 12% difference in salary offered on the basis of the name at the top of the CV. Okay, so this is just, it's, it's a study that I've talked about enough now that it seems straightforward. Um, that this is what's going on. And what got me interested when I started digging is that this is actually based on a lot of literature carried out in psychology over many, many years, which demonstrates that these effects happen all over the place. So the only reason it got such attention was that it was carried out on scientists. And the reason for that was, as the authors wrote in the introduction, because there was a hypothesis that scientists had been rigorously trained to be objective and therefore would not demonstrate such biases. Right, um, hypothesis disproved. So yeah, there is one other very important thing to say, um, which is that the participants in the study, that the um, academics were both men and women themselves, and there is no difference in the extent to which men and women are biased in this respect. In this unconscious respect that comes through statistically like this, there's no difference. Now, what that means is that this is something we all have to take on board. It's something cultural, it's something societal, it's not about men versus women. It's just something about whether we see science as fitting um, with being a woman or not. And so, yeah. Um, I have gotten very interested in this, but I'm also very interested in the way that we talk about the problem of women in science. Um, this is actually a, a little article from The Onion, but when I read the title, I kind of felt like they'd stopped doing satire because it's just too true. Um, there's a lot of effort put into encouraging girls into science, and there's not necessarily enough understanding of the problem. Um, mm -hmm to actually break the cycle and take us away from this, this, this 
paradigm in which we need to keep pumping the pipeline full of women at one end uh, to compensate for the fact that many of them leave. All right, so I think we need to do better. I think as scientists, we should be able to look at the literature and see what's there and understand it and think of ways to do better. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from, really. Um, here we go. So this is that quote from, uh, from the paper that, um, that outlines that hypothesis. So this just isn't true. Science might be objective in principle. Individual scientists aren't necessarily. Yes. Um, so there are two different things going on. One is the stereotype of what it is to be a scientist, and one is the stereotype of what it is to be a leader or an expert. Um, they're interacting, and so uh, I would say a lot of this does apply well outside of science, but um, some of the initial ways in which we evaluate the, the, the value of work and the, the, the interplay between the scientific stereotypes specifically and gender, is it's, it's just got this extra little thing to it, I suppose. And, um, and I think, to me, a large part of that is this insistence on objectivity, which our colleagues in the humanities might not insist on quite so much. For example, um, so I do. I do think that this is a a myth in science. This is a, a picture of some famous physicists from one of the Solvay conferences. So there are some fairly well-known figures on this picture. There's Einstein. There's Rutherford. There's Curie. There's yeah, Bohr. Um, there's also Mary Curie sitting in the front row. Uh, she's the only one who seems to be regularly referred to by her first name. There's, there are all these little things that pop up when you start looking at this picture, which is why I like it. But there is something about this idea that we are great individuals who are objective and the way that we portray scientific research as being carried out by great individuals who, who are responsible for this wonderful, these wonderful advances in the world. Um, there's something in there that we actually need to unpack a little bit, to unpack what's going on when, we, when we're looking at unconscious bias. The stereotype that we are somehow, um, that science is objective because scientists are objective is problematic. And I think we need to do a much better job of talking about teamwork, of talking about collaboration, of talking about scientific principles like reproducibility, which are actually the things that enforce objectivity of science as an aspiration, as a thing that we're trying to converge towards um, finding out some objective truth. Um, and so as part of that, um, one thing I do discuss a little bit in the book is this concept of objectivity, because to come back to your point, this is the, the science specific thing. And I think I was really interested in what is there that's science specific um, that might not be quite the same thing as what's going on in the humanities. And, and this is really, um, one of the things, and I, I see it very clearly in physics, which is perhaps why I talk about it so much. Um, and it turns out that the history of the concept itself is really interesting. So this is a, um, a study that was done by a man called Worthington uh, at the end of the 19th century. And he started by um, using drops of mercury um, and dropping them onto a glass plane and sketching out the shapes that resulted in order to understand how liquids behaved and how they would splash um, and what's going on because so much is happening very quickly you sort of need to to try and sketch this out and so he he did this very careful um, experimental setup drew these exquisite drawings and he's very specific about what he sees he says uh, there's a an exquisite shell-like configuration. Um, the number of rays that emanate from the drop was ascertained to have been generally about 24, he says, which is quite precise. And he sketches these all out. Um, then, of course, photography came along. Right? And so this is just one of the ways in which we can, we can understand the changes that have occurred about the way we consider ourselves objective as scientists when we take measurements. So, he starts taking pictures of exactly the same experiments. And it turns out that they look quite different to his sketches. And so he discusses this in his work. And he says, well, I have to confess that actually I do find these records of asymmetrical or irregular drop splashes. But in compiling things together and trying to, to summarize and, and create something that could be transmitted, um, it's been inevitable that these unique incidences that are never quite the same 
are rejected and I keep the things that are consistent from one experiment to the next. And so he talks about this, that there's something, um, and I think we see this a lot in physics about idealization of data because you want to find the common underlying truth, perhaps, um, that is actually a little bit problematic when we think of ourselves as objective observers. Now, is the camera actually more objective or, or not? Um, it's an interesting question. And I just add this in to say that actually objective, objectivity means different things to different people. In biology, of course, you have quite a different way of, of dealing with what is the ideal specimen. Um, you know, whether you've got uh, a, a particular specimen of a species which that um, organism is kind of defined by, uh, or whether you have a, a representation which actually is an idealized version of a plant which might have something quite unrealistic about it in terms of having both the fruit and the, the flowers depicted at the same time, for example. So quite how we deal with objectivity in different areas of science is different. And so I think that has to lead us to question what we mean by it, and in particular, the extent to which we hold it up as some sort of scientific virtue. So the follow-up question I have about this is how much harm it really does to consider ourselves objective when we're not. Um, there is a study, and I don't think I've got it in this version of this presentation, that does look at the effect of self-evaluations of objectivity on um, unconscious bias as demonstrated in these kinds of CV comparative studies and it shows reasonably clearly that actually if you consider yourself to be highly objective you're more likely to be relying on your unconscious biases right? if you don't consider yourself objective you're much more likely to be thinking through your criteria uh, the criteria that you're using to make a decision so um, that's part of what's going on there is something else about this in terms of the harm that can be done and here, I guess, what I'm trying to do is connect up a few different things because the book that I wrote is really trying to connect some of the, I guess, the microaggressions that happen to women, some of the very soft, subtle forms of sexism with the underrepresentation of women, which is very statistically evident. And I guess what I'd like to do now is try to connect that statistical underrepresentation of women with other forms of harm. Uh, that can occur. So there have been just in the last few years a few studies coming out around sexual harassment in science which is not something I will say that not something I touch on in the book at all because it wasn't something I knew enough about at the time and I guess I felt like I was writing a 101 in terms of describing how unconscious bias impacts on the representation of women in science. Um, I think I may have graduated to stage two, and it is very clear that there are bigger issues and that we need to think about other problems as well and connect up some of these dots. So this is a study that looks at um, uh, sexual harassment in fieldwork and the geophysical sciences in particular. And all I'll say is that um, probably the, the main thing to say is that there are differences in the experiences of men and women, and in particular, um, when women are sexually harassed, it is most commonly from a direct superior. And I think that has to inform some of the concerns that we have about the way uh, students are treated and about the way that we deal with the idea that women choose to leave science. I think we have to be very careful about some of those ideas. Um, the, another thing that happened, and this was pretty much the month after the book came out, uh, was um, a series of stories actually about sexual harassment in astrophysics, which are quite harrowing um, in some ways. I'll just leave uh, the hashtag up here in case anyone is interested in, in searching for this. There's a lot on Twitter um, that you can find just by, by clicking through this. And so the, the little um, series of uh, texts I have is from a, a story on BuzzFeed. Uh, there's a reporter, Azim, I can't pronounce her last name, who, who uncovered a lot of these stories and she really worked to gain the trust of some of the women who were sharing their stories. And so this is a, a particular astrophysicist who um, developed a romantic attachment to one of his students and then 
uh, lent on another student in the same group, also a woman, uh, and was texting her all the time about his relationship with the other student. And then you know, both these women eventually uh, complained, although I think in both cases it was after they'd been um, moved outside the university by the university, uh, which had basically said, no, he stays, you have to go. Um, that seems to be the common outcome uh, in these cases. Uh, but the good thing about this, I, I've really put this part up just to highlight that there is a conversation going on about how we can do better. And I think the really positive thing about this is that it's not just about improving things for women, but maybe for all of us. Um, so this is by Sean Carroll, who's a physicist, and he writes a blog. Um, he has this rather nice title, We Suck But We Can Be Better. I've pulled out a particular quote from that blog post here. And he just sort of says, well, actually, we have to admit that we're flawed. We have to admit that we get things wrong. Um, and we worry too much about um, the reputations of our institutions and of ourselves, rather than worrying about the lives of people that are affected by these kinds of problems. And it is something that I think universities have to take very seriously, the idea that actually we have moral responsibilities to our students. Um, and the reputation of the university is not the paramount thing, um, and the reputation of particular academics is not the most important thing either. So, oh. Sorry, it's just that in order that the Christchurch people and yep. people here. Thank you. Um, so my question to Nicola is um, this problem she's just raised about how we our defence of the institution seems to take over from our need to defend the individual that's been sexually harassed. And I've seen a case of that here at the university and a, a much worse case at um, a government department where the woman who'd been sexually harassed basically was either told or encouraged or you know, told to clear off to another part of the uh, country while the person who had done the sexual harassment stayed in their normal position and might have had some really minor you know, disadvantages but not so as anybody would have noticed. What can we do as a university or, or a society to There's get nothing simple. That? Um, that would be my, my basic assessment, but I think that's no, no reason not to do things. Um, I do think the biggest thing is to create a culture in which women feel safe speaking up. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I do think it's about making it clear that institutions cannot get away with this, that if something comes out, it's, you know, you know it is the end of the world. Yes, yes, the institutions look better. Um, I'll just paraphrase that for the, for Christchurch. Yep. Um, absolutely, absolutely. I will talk, I've got a few slides sort of trying to get to this, so I'll, I'll keep going. Um, this is actually a really nice, series of pieces in Forbes uh, by Janet Stemwiddle, who's one of the, um, one of the people I, I, uh, whose work I follow very closely on this, um, on this stuff. She used to be a physical chemist and she transitioned mid-career to working in philosophy. Um, both of these things are, are highly male dominated, but there's still quite a big change from science to uh, a, a discipline in the humanities. Um, and so she writes about ethics and philosophy and science and there's a series of pieces reporting tales of harassment and what needs to be done. Um, and this is her final piece in the series uh, where she really talks about what we can do and what we should do. And she describes it as a cultural problem and she describes it as um, being a general problem about how we prioritize the science over people. Um, and that actually the way that we deal with and respect our students and postdocs and that we deal with lives intersecting with scientific careers, that that's actually all part of the problem. And so um, 
this is a quick summary around some of the things that she sees as being most problematic in the culture of science in particular, the academia in general, I think. Um, I won't read all of those out, but that last one is probably one of the ones that I think is most insidious. I think it's one of the ones that we're judged on most, most harshly, and it, it's actually completely impossible to live up to. Um, it's, yeah, but it's, it's there. So there are a bunch of different things going on internationally. Um, one issue I was following for a while is the postdoc issue in the States where they were trying to create the opportunity for postdocs to get overtime pay. Uh, postdocs in the States are also paid really badly, like worse than here, <laughs> which is um, maybe amazing, but um, it's, yeah, so there are these real issues around careers and how we, how we treat people. Um, the postdoc issue, oh, this is, re uh, it's, it's kind of an aside because I, I have also, with other um, concerns in mind, uh, been very frustrated at the loss of the postdoc, the nationally funded postdoc scheme that we used to have in New Zealand, the forced postdocs. I came back to New Zealand as a forced postdoc and half the people I know um, who had overseas postdoc experience came back on the same scheme and we just don't have anything like that these days. And one of the things that frustrates me is that you talk to, well, I used to talk to Stephen Joyce about this a little bit and he'd always go, oh no, no, but we, we, we understand the postdoc problem, we understand the postdoc problem. It took me a while to realise that actually what he thought he knew was based on the US experience of postdocs where there is a glut of postdocs. It's, it's a little bit more like what we have with PhD students here. And so if you're reading science, and trying to keep up on this, you think there are too many postdocs in the world, and actually, not in New Zealand. Um, so it's it's yeah. Anyway, careers and career structure are really important, and I do think that's a big part of the problem. Giving people the stability and the safety to feel that they can speak up when there is a problem—that's a big part of it. Um, here's just another example of people. Um, uh, selling that line that science is more important than everything else, you know, um, as a chemist, uh, and he, he gave this quote to a, a piece in, in science. When I did a postdoc, money was not my prime motivator. The experience itself was priceless. And I think we need to understand a little bit better the way that personal privilege allows people to, to perpetuate the unhealthy career structures that we have, and particularly in science where things like postdocs are much more important for your career development than they would be in the academics and the humanities. So that's another sort of small technical piece of the puzzle, I think, in terms of what the difference is. Um, I did quite like this when that um, quote came out on that science, uh, science um, uh, article. Uh, this is a picture of the, the current postdocs in his lab, so maybe it does matter how much you're paying them. Maybe you do want to be paying them peanuts. Maybe he's not actually that objective about the issue, one might say. Um, and I quite like that tweet from a colleague at Victoria who um, pointed out that most of the women are kneeling in the front row, which <laughs> yeah, um, is not necessarily a great sign. Anyway, um, so in answer to your question, I think actually a big part of the issue, maybe this is something for the TEU to think about, is um, thinking about career structure, thinking about protections for young people that avoid some of these problems happening at that stage when people are most vulnerable. Um, I've got a few slides of data in here that I'll just run through and then I think I'll, I'll wrap up and we can have more of a conversation. Um, but one of the things I think it's really important to think about are issues of access to education. Uh, this is a part of the whole puzzle um, when you're talking about equity. And I know I haven't talked at all about anything other than gender here, but a lot of the time when we're talking about um, gender in science, we do need to be conscious of issues to do with race and ethnicity and underrepresentation of other groups um, in education and in science. And part of this is what education actually means for people and what it does and how it changes your life or doesn't. But um, some of the messages that come out about why you should study to get a job because you'll be paid so much more than if you don't go to university. Um, I mean, these are true messages. Uh, they're a bit dangerous and there was quite a bit of conversation about this yesterday at the um, panel about the humanities and how, you know, 
especially thinking about comparing humanities and science and the relative value of them. Um, I think all of us have to be a bit better about insisting that knowledge and knowledge generation and education are actually key things that we do in a university and that we have that in common rather than um, being, rather than allowing um, political messages about you know, people needing to do STEM in order to get a job and contribute to the economy, um, we, we need to be able to disentangle that a bit better. So this is just looking at OECD data on the private benefits of education, which is to say, I guess, the return on investment over your lifetime if you're a man. Um, the data is all reasonably easy to find. And you look at New Zealand, we're actually very close to the OECD average in terms of cost, which is the way it's ranked. But of course, the private benefit side of the equation varies a lot between countries. Um, so that doesn't look too bad. That's the private benefit of education for men. Um, when you look at the private benefits of education for women, you see there's a significant drop in that return on investment. Um, and if you are the previous chancellor of Massey University, you look at that and you say it's not a reason, it's a reason not to train as many women because they don't, there isn't the same payoff at the end. So that was uh, the, the comments that he made about um, changes to their vet uh, school and how they were trying to get more men in to study vet because the female vets that they were graduating were worth two fifths as much as a normal vet over their lifetime because they get married and have children and all of this stuff. And so he makes this comment publicly justifying, and this is the, the crucial awful part of it, justifying that as a reason to make changes to their, their vet intake and how they um, recruit people. Anyway, so the private benefits of education are less for women than they are for men. That is also an equity issue. Um, the public benefits of education for men and women also vary. Uh, here, where's New Zealand, it's just below the OECD average. We're pretty close to it on both counts. Um, and for women, again, the public benefits are um, reduced rather. What do you mean by public and private? So the private benefit is, oh, sorry. Uh, so the question is what, what's the difference between public and private benefit? Um, I'll, I'll refer you to them for a complete definition, but I think you can uh, simply understand it as what you will earn over your lifetime being private benefit to yourself. And then public benefits are things like um, increased tax return to the government based on the fact that you're earning more or that you're, you're in a more, um, I guess, a, a more GDP contributing sector of the economy. I'm not an economist, but something like that. Yeah, nobody seems upset by me fudging that. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so what can we do? Um, here are some just suggestions for conversation, really. So if anybody wants to pipe up, uh, feel free. Uh, one of the things that we often talk about are role models and mentors, and I think these things are important, but they're really not the whole picture. Um, so one of the initiatives uh, that you may have heard of is um, the Ada Lovelace Day, which recognises Ada Lovelace, um, who was a computer programmer. Um, and what they are trying to do is, is actually, I guess, correct the historical record and say, actually, there, there have been women doing this stuff. It's just that they've been neglected, they haven't been held up um, with the, the striking example of Mary Curie. Um, they haven't you know, sort of ended up in the archive of pictures and of the way that we represent science historically. Um, so that's part of you know, holding up some role models. On the other hand, there are, let's say, um, trade-offs or uh, there can be pushback to this idea of holding up women in science as role models. And one of the, the um, things that I think is saddest is this paper that I saw, this thing I saw in The Guardian, I think. Um, and so this is a, a woman who was uh, doing some television work. She was a mathematician. I can't remember her name. And she was sort of held up as this, this great role model because um, she was a mathematician and she was also pretty. And then, of course, the counter to that, the idea that the prettiness itself is a negative thing. There's this, it just shows up again, the tension between the stereotype of what it is to be a woman and the stereotype of what it is to be a scientist. And we have to do a little bit better than that. We have to have role models who are and aren't pretty and it, it shouldn't matter, but of course it still kind of does. So that's one of the things that's tricky. Um, 
So we have to distinguish between those kinds of things and keeping women in STEM. So it's not just about force feeding the pipeline um, because, because of that Onion article that I showed you at the beginning. And so I have a, a Hunger Games reference here, which is, I guess, about the keeping women in STEM part. Um, and this is partly around mentors, but it's partly around more than mentors. And the, the distinction I try to make is about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. And the Hunger Games is actually quite good for this because both of the words appear and it's actually quite relevant. So a mentor is somebody who's been where you've been and is going to talk to you about their experiences in the movie. Uh, that's a bit, well, anyway. Um, you might think he's not the best mentor, but then who knows. Um, Whereas sponsors in the movie, if you remember, if you've seen it, um, are the people who pay money to buy you stuff that gets floated into the arena, like practical stuff that helps, right? And a lot of what people need to get ahead is not just mentorship, where mentorship is great, you actually need sponsorship. And sponsorship is perhaps the thing that is most lacking in terms of getting women into senior leadership positions. It's having the people around in the background who are willing to take a risk on a woman and say, no, she's going to be good at that. She hasn't done it yet, but she's going to be good at it. I'm willing to, you know, to back her, uh, to put my money on the table and do that. So that's, I think, one of the conversations that we need to have about keeping women in science and actually having the leaky pipeline um, stop leaking. Uh, that's, that's one of the key things I think is important. Again, um, yeah. Recruitment, retention, progression, they're, they're different things. Um, the picture on the left is from a slightly misguided um, effort by the European Commission to get women into science, girls into science, which again uh, had a lot of backlash because of the stereotypical representation of what girls are interested in, lipstick and so on. But then a lot of the comments, the backlash from women in science were like, no, no, we're scientists, we don't wear lipstick. And neither of those is necessarily the right place to be. Um, all of this should be okay. And so the picture on uh, the right is you know, not, you know, it's, it's been floating around on the internet since forever. Um, but I think it's, it's important to distinguish between equality and equity. And I think that's a conversation that's mostly been worked through at this point. I think most people understand that equity is about looking at the outcomes, not just some sort of legal equality that in theory, if unconscious bias didn't exist, would lead to equal outcomes. Um, I think we can actually judge how well we do by outcomes and by that standard, we're not doing well enough. Um, so that's the book, final plug. Um, oh, and I did want to just run through some things about the experience of having written it, because I think maybe that's interesting for people. Um, so this is a, a clipping that the mother of a friend cut out of the Christchurch Press, and partly I have it just because of that, it was, just, it was very sweet of her. Um, so she, she cut this out and it, it waffles on a bit. Um, the key thing is over on the right hand side where he's going on about, well, both firstly mating behavior and that's probably the point at which you should switch off if you're um, reading uh, uh, letters to the editor in favor. Uh, but the, the next part is the relative brain sizes to be affected, blah, 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 blah. Um, and the reason I put this up is just to say that people are really attached to the idea that society is as it is because that's the way it should be. Um, people push back on these things, you should expect them to. Um, what's interesting is how much of the argument and the pushback on this ends up being quite pseudoscientific, kind of you know, misappropriating concepts from biology, from you know, evolution. Um, and I think as scientists, maybe that's something we can actually grapple with and actually say, no, that's not what the science is at all, um, because it doesn't. And there's no reason that, um, yeah, I mean, that the relationship between brain size and function and human individuals, I mean, it's just, it, it's not, it's not a thing. Um, so that's kind of the, the negative side of feedback. Like there is some, but mostly it's relatively easy to dismiss. Right? There will always be people um, who feel a bit attached to the way things are, I suppose. Um, one thing that was really nice was to be asked to write something for Chemistry World. Uh, which I wrote around when the book came out. And, um, well, there's a funny story about that, which isn't captured here, uh, which is that they gave the piece a title after I wrote it, of course. You don't get to your own things. And they called it Rooting Out Sexism. 
which <laughs> was for a UK publication. It was completely yeah. innocent, but I spent the day on Twitter going, no, 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 that, that. I didn't, firstly, I didn't write it and it's okay in the UK. Um, <laughs> It was not intended. Um, but what's nice about doing things like that is actually there are forums in which I find I get a lot of really positive feedback, and that's one of the reasons I keep doing this. Um, so on Twitter, for example, uh, that went up. And so I'm, I'm using this as an example because there's feedback from people I've never met and don't know anything about, and that's kind of nice. Um, so one of them pulled out a quote from the piece I wrote. I think that's pretty much what I ended the piece with. Um, there's nothing wrong with girls who don't like science, but there is something wrong with science that doesn't like girls. Um, and that's kind of where I've, I've gotten to feel about it. Uh, this is actually an extract from an, an email. Um, Ignore the bit about it being the most well-written book I've read in a long time. I've read better written books in the last month. Um, but the point is that I've had a lot of nice feedback from people and I've met a lot of nice people um, who actually care and are trying to change the world in their own way and so I'm not saying that everybody should stand up and start being more vocal about this but I definitely feel like it's been a, a positive experience for me so I think it's worth sharing that so thank you um, I will close with a Max Planck quote um, because I guess I am a physicist these days um, and in some contexts I would consider this an optimistic quote and I, I don't, uh, but it's probably realistic unless we keep intervening, unless we keep trying to fix the problem, unless we keep trying to do better. Um, that's actually how it is. So. Thank you for coming, and um, I do actually want to have some conversation, if that's possible. Also, with Christchurch, if you wave at any point or just speak up, I'm sure we can, we can talk to you too. Thank you.